Do you know any of that stuff, or do you want me to? Just kidding. <laughs> Uh, so this is Helmer's Organic Farm, and I'm Anna Helmer, and this is my dad, Doug. And I've been working on the farm as an adult for 25 or so years. And so mom and dad, Doug and Jeanette, began this organic potato farm incarnation, sort of the early 90s. We've just built the business on the Vancouver farmers markets, and on quality, I guess, because if it tastes good, then we'll grow it. If it doesn't taste good, then we won't bother because it's quite a lot of work. <laughs> so I'm here and my sister Jenny is here. Um, and my sister Lisa has a couple of kids, so they're around. So we have quite a bit of help. And then we also have people that come and work with us. Uh, well, we grow around seven acres of potatoes each year. And, and this year we have 12 varieties. And we have a sort of half acre of carrots, beets and parsnips some celeriac as well. Garlic, yeah, we've got a nice garlic crop this year. We have a farm stand, so pretty much anything we can grow is a cash crop. Our sales outlets right now are the Pemberton Market, the farm stand, and then Discovery Organics in Vancouver for our restaurant business. So our farm is certified organic through PAX, and we've been certified organic for, I don't know, how long now? Yeah, 1996, 1996 we finally got full yeah. certification. Yeah. And then we also use biodynamic practices, and we've been certified biodynamic off and on for about the same amount of time, I think. Our farming practices are built around long rotations, minimal inputs, and the minimal amount of disturbance we can do to the soil. Potatoes require a lot of soil work. You know, we started off with uh, not doing much, but in order to get a, a reasonable crop, you need a nice tilth. And so we grow a crop of potatoes in year one. The next year we try and get it back into a grass clover mix as soon as possible. And we leave it in that grass clover mix for three to four years before we go back to the same field. So we have five separate fields growing about seven acres each year. And then in 1992, we put in about a quarter of acre of potatoes. We were just basically turning over sod and planting potatoes in sod. Nobody could believe it. They were waist high. Here we were with a piece of land that had never been farmed in history. It never occurred to us to um, get into using inputs. We thought, you know, we'll just try see if what the land can produce. So we were true organic farmers in the middle of a pretty flourishing seed potato industry in Pemberton. And the seed growers were pretty nervous about letting us grow with no sprays, no fertilizer, nothing, because the tolerance for viruses coming out of Pemberton was basically zero. Eventually they agreed that if we got our tops off by the 1st of July, we, um, we intentionally grew nugget potatoes rather than large potatoes because we didn't want to take too much out of the ground. We weren't adding anything. So we went to the Vancouver farmers markets. Um, people loved them, so there we were with a market and a crop, and that's sort of the background that um, we didn't want to use inputs, fertilizers, or sprays. And um, it's basically been um, just experimenting with how we could do that. The proof, I guess, is in the pudding. There's a steady increase of yield from the potato fields. Like the field that we're in right now this year, I remember, I think we almost lost the farm 10 or 15 years ago. So three rotations ago, it was just atrocious, that field. And it was full of wireworm and it was low yield. It was a really tough year. We just worked at it. We just worked on the cover cropping. We had to get irrigation. Climate change has affected this farm. We never used to irrigate, but in 2008, I think it was, or 10 or something, something like we um, had to get water. So we put a well down and started to water the cover crops to make sure that they would take. And that field in particular, it has an, the old riverbed runs through it. It's just got some really tough, challenging areas. So here we were again this year in that field. It was a tough year in this field again, but again, it's five times the yield or something that we had in that three rotations ago yield. So we're doing, the right thing somehow with this cover cropping business <laughs> and the the potatoes seem to really love it every year we wonder um is it going to work is 
can we keep doing this? We keep taking things out of the soil. Are we putting enough back in? There's nothing in the literature that helps because um, you're not supposed to be able to do that. Keep taking out and not putting back in. That's, that's the thinking that's developed. You have to measure what you're taking out and then put that equivalent amount back in, but no more or you cause problems. The soil provides our nourishment. The soil isn't just there to hold up the plant so the fertilizer can go to work. We need the soil to be in condition to grow potatoes. So we spend an awful lot of time thinking about when shall we do this? What shall we use on the soil? Is it gonna work? Did it work last year? Do you remember 10 years ago we did this? Things are always changing. But yeah, costs are going up, especially fuel. Our no-till or low-till cedar has definitely helped in that regard because we were able to plant that mustard crop without any cultivation. Just right yeah. there yeah. is a huge savings. You know, the machine itself is quite a buy. I mean, right away it saved a lot. So yeah. it's just a numbers game. And then the treffler has been quite something because it just lessens the weed pressure. We haven't got all the weeds out with it. But now instead of, it's not so bad, it's more of a pluck and fluff than a like the rescue weeder, mission, the yeah, the tine weeder. So we've definitely, we're definitely affected by the fuel cost, but we feel like we've got a, we've got a plan in place for that. Yeah, our, we've mentioned before the cover cropping program is five years. So that means potatoes once every five years and other crops, crops to put something back into the soil for four years and also in those four years, crops that might help fight pests. Basically, for us, it's been buckwheat, mustard, fall rye, a forage mix of red and white clover, timothy, perennial ryegrass, and orchard grass. That's been the, the, the planting crops, in, in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're standing here in field one. We don't have a lot of imagination when it comes to field names, and it's definitely our best field. Um, right now it's planted back to the forage mix so you can see the red clover and the white clover and there's timothy and orchard grass and perennial rye. This is its third year, third summer of growth and we mow it four to six times. It can happen a lot in a big growth year. So when you, when you part the grass you can see all the mulch. That's our whole program is making this mulch. So this field, every time we mow it, it leaves this layer of mulch and that mulch is going to become the organic matter and that is our entire fertility program. That's where everything happens, all the biological activity, all the organic activity happens in that material. And so our whole aim is to create lots of organic matter. We think the earthworms are coming up into that. It's retaining moisture. This field is green. It hasn't been watered once this year. It hasn't been watered once in three years, <laughs> as a matter of fact. It's all about this. This, is, this, I guess, is where the main farming is happening on the farm. I mean, the potato fields take a lot of farming, that's true, but this is, this is more what we're farming, is this cover cropping. And this is what's getting the, sh the field back into shape for potatoes. So it has another two years. And now what we'll do with our low till thing is, is mow it quite short and then come through and plant probably mustard, but perhaps buckwheat. You do have to be careful with buckwheat because it goes to seed. It sets this really hard seed that's talk about resilience and it just grows through anything at any time. So if you put buckwheat seed in the ground before you put potatoes in, you better be ready to have buckwheat in your potatoes <laughs> and a lot of it. But th that's, our, that's our program is growing this crop as well as we can, mowing it as much as possible and totally making organic matter. That's it. This is the result of the cutting. So it's not as if we're cutting hay where it's just laying down a big swath in lengths. This is, this is chopped up pretty finely. When I go through here, it leaves a, a pretty good s swath of this stuff, this chopped up stuff. And there's not that much left, especially after three years. So it is going into the soil. I think when we do work this field in for potatoes, we do it the year before potatoes, ideally, because we're adding a lot of carbon 
and we're at adding a lot of clover that does have um, nodules on that are producing nitrogen for the plants. If we work in the fall, it gives us about half a year for the carbon nitrogen balance to get back to where it should be. As Anna said, that, that's basically it. There's a lot, a lot of um, growth going back into the soil. So we use a, a cover crop mix, um, a forage mix that Dad and uh, Noel Roddick made up. Noel Roddick is an agrologist uh, that helped us a lot when we were developing this cover crop program. And it's a mix of clovers and perennial rye and orchard grass, Timothy. It's a mix. It comes in a big sack and it's, our, it's the one thing we purchase and we seed it. We've never changed this mix. It seems to do perfectly well, it does the trick, that's that. Last year we got a, a what's called a minimum till seeder for grass and clover. It will cut through a thatch, it'll cut through grass and it'll lay a seed. And I think that's very important because um, there's a lot of problems in potatoes with wireworm. Studies have shown that mustard and buckwheat can deter wireworm. And up until we got this cedar, we have been taking our grass clover mix, might be three years old, um, working it into the ground, planting mustard or buckwheat to fight the wireworm, letting it grow, cutting it, working it into the ground. But with this new cedar, we can leave the grass clover and plant the mustard, or buck, especially buckwheat, directly into the grass clover, and it'll be cut with the grass and clover. As long as we cut the mustard and buckwheat before they flower, the roots will keep growing. And the compound in the above ground is also in the roots, so the roots themselves will deter the wireworm. Yeah, this is two years old for us, and it's a minimum till cedar, not a zero till. And it's a precision cedar. When we put a seed in, we fill the first three little um, mini bins in here and then we take this handle and if we're doing um, say 30 pounds per acre or something we guess at where the setting should be for the opening of the seed to fall out and then we take this handle turn it a certain number of times measure how much seed has fallen out and take the equivalent to 30 pounds per acre and see how we're doing. Just keep fiddling around until, until we get it. If you can come around the back a bit, uh, we don't have a small seed box on this. It's, it's just for fall rye, mustard, and um, buckwheat. It's a great big bin and the, the seed is let out on 12 of these little openers here. It falls down and the work is done by, the, by these little discs which cut through the grass and then the press wheels push it down and the pr press wheels determine the depth. We set the press wheels here. This is a mi minimum till disc or planter, a real zero till planter that will really cut through something like a corn stalk. has another sharp little disc in front of those openers, but I can put enough pressure with this to go through anything that we grow, like a three-year thatch of grass, clover, or four-year, whatever, which is a big advantage. It saves us a lot of fuel, a lot of work, a lot of time. So it, it has been a good investment. So the other input that we use is manure, or compost, I should say. We've had cattle, and we had some beautiful compost out of that, uh, but we're not running cattle for now. So we've been buying cow manure from a, a farmer up the road. However, he has sold his farm. So we're out of manure source, but what we do have a lot of are cull potatoes. You know, even if I'm happy with 5% of the crop being cull, that's a lot of, that's a lot of cull potatoes. We need to do something with them. And the cows were good for eating potatoes. They just clean up a potato field in no time. They eat gobs of potatoes. So that was sort of a happy, union or marriage of I have too many potatoes and we need compost so we've been experimenting with composting the potatoes and we've had some success and this is where our biodynamic practice comes in because we use the 
biodynamic preparations and turn the potatoes into, into usable, usable dirt. And we use that on our uh, beets and parsnips and the garlic and celeriac. We don't use any compost or manure on the potato fields, but for those other crops we do. They're a little heavier feeders specifically. Um, and so that's what it's for. Hello, I'm Teresa Porter. I'm a soil science educator and articling agrologist. I'm at the Helmers field right now. This is one of their um, sites where they have a five-year rotation. So what they're doing is they have one year of cash crops and they follow that by three years of a forage mix. So what we're seeing right now is the forage mix. Um, so this is what they have for three years. And we're gonna talk about what the potential benefits are of this crop rotation. So we're gonna talk about what's likely happening in these fields, improving soil, soil health and benefits to future crops. So one of the first things that comes to mind is when we have a continuous grass cover for three years, what we're doing is we're building soil structure. So grasses have really great root systems. They're extensive and they have really fine root hairs and these help hold soil structure together. So um, they exude compounds that glue particles together um, and they also provide habitat for a diverse community of soil organisms that also contribute to what we call aggregate formation. Aggregate formation is the process through which individual and groups of soil particles come together to form building blocks of structure. Soil structure is really important for a variety of different things that make soil a good um, place for plants to grow. So um, some of that is soil infiltration, drainage, aeration, water holding capacity, um, resistance to erosion, resistance to uh, degradation, and also carbon storage. So the grasses are helping to rebuild or improve soil structure, especially if we're leaving them for a continuous period. So we have three years of grass cover, and then we have another year of the cover crop. So that's really helping soil structure rebuild and strengthen. Another benefit that we're probably seeing in this soil is the replenishing of a diverse soil biotic community. Soil biota need a plant cover. That's where they get their food and find their habitat. Um, and so having prolonged period of rest from tillage as well as continuous cover allows for a diverse community to rebuild in terms of numbers and in terms of diversity. So one example that comes to mind is our buscular mycorrhizal fungi. They're the most common group of, of mycorrhizal fungi that form association with crop plants. They have a lot of benefits like um, nutrient scavenging, drought resistance, resistance to different pests and diseases. So what I imagine is happening when the Helmers leave these fields for three years under forage and then even one year under a cover crop is that we're seeing a replenishment of a diverse biological community. Soil biota are really important for nutrient cycling in soils and so they are what make nutrients become available to plants. Another good example is, of that is nitrogen fixing bacteria. So when we plant legumes, which are included in this mix and also often used as a cover crop right before um, the cash crop, rhizobium form associations like symbiotic relationships with plants where they are actually um, transforming nitrogen gas into ammonia, which becomes available to plants. Plants alone cannot access nitrogen gas which is abundant in the atmosphere but they can trade carbon compounds for ammonia which is what they do with rhizobium bacteria so we see that soil biology is really important for nutrient cycling and for providing nutrients to plant communities okay so another great thing about grass lay is that the roots add a lot of biomass um, below ground so the roots will uh, slough off and add organic matter to the soil. So it can take a really long time. We may not see increases in carbon after just one year or even after just one cycle of this rotation. Um, but over time, we are building organic matter and then that's gonna become available to plants as microbes are cycling the nutrients from the organic matter and making it available to plants. Because the Helmers have been doing this rotation for quite a long time, it's possible that at this point they're really reaping the benefits of the added organic matter, the improved soil biological community, stable soil structure.
It can take a long time to reach that point when you're implementing management practices that improve soil sustainability. But at this point, the Helmers are no longer using external inputs and, and the things that we talked about today might be some of the reasons why they're able to do that. So they're no longer adding fertilizers or compost to their soil. Um, it can take a long time for a field to reach that point and we don't have um, soil test results from their farm, but some of the things we talked about today are potential reasons why their potatoes um, seem to be doing really well with this rotation system. Another thing that boosts water holding capacity of a soil is organic matter. So because we are over time building organic matter through these cover crops and grass lays, over time we're also building soil water holding capacity through that mechanism. So water holding capacity is really important um, in terms of drought tolerance. So if your soil can hold onto water without it all draining, you're more able to um, provide water to plants for a longer period. Uh, mycorrhizal associations also help with drought tolerance because fungal hyphae can scavenge for water um, in places that plant roots can't. So building healthy biological communities also help with drought tolerance. So another benefit of this three year grass lay followed by a cover crop that I did mention is um, a reprieve from tillage. So providing a break from tillage, providing a break from the compactive effects of heavy machinery on the soil allow for a break from destruction of soil structure, which tillage does lead to, as well as the destruction of, or like disturbance of soil biology. So having a break from that helps rebuild soil biological communities as well as help rebuild soil structure.